The Central Park area is one of Tampa's most culturally and historically rich neighborhoods. Despite its achievements, the neighborhood could not escape the racial and economic struggles that prevailed in many inner city neighborhoods during the 1960s. A racial disturbance in 1967 helped seal the demise of the Central Avenue Business Corridor. Since then, neglect and disenfranchisement have largely characterized the area. Documentary filmmaker Travis A. Bell joins today's discussion. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing with our viewers and our community. And I'm not sure just what I should call you. <laughs> uh, you're a professor at USF. I am, yes. I'm an instructor in mass communications. And then uh, I'm also finishing my PhD in communication at USF. And uh, I've sort of become an as aspiring filmmaker uh, in these five years of making the switch to USF. So mm -hmm. I, I try to wear a variety of hats, which is good. And a former reporter. And a former reporter, yeah. I worked in television for 12 years, the last six of which I was at uh, WTSP in Tampa as uh, actually a sports reporter. Uh, mm -hmm. Sports was my primary background, but since leaving, I still have a lot of interest in sort of the intersection of sport and media, but uh, I've, I've found a lot of interest in the intersection of race and media. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's what led me to here. Well, one of the th stories that has not been told, and we are blessed to be talking with the filmmaker on the 50th anniversary of the beginning of this story, mm -hmm. your, document, your documentary. Absolutely. Uh, and it is called? The name of the film is called Tampa Technique, Rise, Demise, and Remembrance of Central Avenue. And the hope is to sort of contextualize the civil rights movement within Tampa and the surrounding area, but really primarily focusing in and around Tampa uh, with Central Avenue as sort of the lens of analysis mm -hmm. to look at that civil rights movement. How did all of the different moving parts within the civil rights movement affect the rise and then eventual demise of Central? Let's talk about June 11th, 50 years ago, 1967. Mm -hmm. You start. Yeah. So uh, June 11th, 1967, um, it was in the evening, it was a Sunday, uh, uh, not ironically now, it's the, we celebrate the 50th anniversary on a Sunday. Um, and today is Sunday. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so um, Martin Chambers uh, was a 19-year-old uh, black teenager that lived in Central Park Village, which was the um, housing project to the side of Central Avenue. Um, he and two other individuals were uh, being chased by two police officers. Um, they were suspected of a burglary of a photo supply shop in uh, downtown Tampa. And so they were running back toward Central Park Village where Martin lived. Um, what exactly happened is sort of always up for debate, um, but he was shot by uh, the white police officer who was in pursuit. His name was James Calvert. Um, the, a lot of the reports say he was shot in the back. There are witness accounts that say that he wasn't. Um, but the unfortunate thing is Martin did die about 30 minutes later at Tampa General Hospital. And it was in the evening, uh, and within a few hours, um, there started to be a civil disturbance. Um, some would call it a riot, some would call it a civil disturbance, but uh, in and around Central Avenue, and that lasted for about three days. 1967, seven, if you will, was quite a year and especially the summer of 67. It sure was. Across this country. Yeah. But no one would have suspected uh, that what took place would have taken place in Tampa. Yeah. But that's like, I think, much as we do now, we deceive ourselves as to hoping that things would be as we would have them mm -hmm. rather than as they are. Absolutely. Racism was still very prevalent there. Um, that area, Tampa, um, had a very, very thriving black community during that time. And, and you document that in your film. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it really sort of bookends the story of Central Avenue. Um, and so the goal for me in this film is to 
make sure that th it's a memory of Central Avenue, um, but look at a lot of the complications um, that led to its rise to prominence through segregation. Um, but it was a thriving business district. Um, but then sort of look at all of these confluence of things, uh, not only Martin Chambers' death that created some physical destruction in and around Central, but urban renewal, the interstate that was coming through. Um, how did all of those things within a few year period embedded within the civil rights movement lead to the demise of Central? And so that's kind of the hope. And I think the irony is in the name Tampa Technique, mm -hmm. um, that comes up in a lot of the research literature from the early to mid 60s and it was sort of the negotiated methodical way that the city of Tampa and the city fathers tried to negotiate race relations and it seemed to be working in a positive way but it was also in a very controlled manner um, and so I think the events of 67 sort of are the are the sort of the black eye in that moment about the Tampa technique not necessarily working for everything mm -hmm. you know when we talk about the Tampa technique with all of the relationships between law enforcement and policemen and young black men being shot mm -hmm. um, now during this current era and we would see things say in Ferguson and other places mm -hmm. and get a little upset because say why is all this military grade equipment being brought mm -hmm. to a community well I'm sure your research told you that at that point during um, Chambers, the disturbance that took place after the death of Chambers, mm -hmm. um, the city fathers, part of the Tampa Technique, mm -hmm. called in law enforcement from Pinellas County, sure. surrounding counties, and the National Guard. Yeah. And they brought in uh, jeeps with machine guns mounted on it. Yeah and deputies with shotguns. Uh, and the reason these stories need to be told is to see how far we have come and how far we haven't come. Absolutely. And I often think of, in people my age, urban renewal as Negro removal. Absolutely. And. Uh, did, is this what you found? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a lot of that is, uh, you know, you call it, whether it's Negro removal or urban removal, uh, you, those terms come up a lot of times in the conversation. Um, <clears throat> and that's exactly what happened in and around Tampa. The, the long-term sort of slow demise of Central Avenue was the separation of the black enclaves that really supported Central. Um, and then there was the push to build Progress Village um, mm -hmm. out to the east um, to displace a lot of the neighborhoods. Um, and that's exactly what happened sort of in and around Tampa. And, uh, and I, I, do, I think it's kind of one of those lost sort of narratives, though, in that what's called the long, hot summer of 67 is Tampa was the first of eight riots that are mentioned in the Kerner Commission, that came, Kerner Commission report that came out in 1968. But it's one of the least talked about. But it was one of the first, and I believe the only major one in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's... That was part of the impetus of wanting to do the film is to really just contextualize the events of 67 in Tampa within what was going on in our nation, but to make sure to keep the conversation centered around how did all of those things affect Central Avenue specifically. And when we talk about Central Avenue, Central Avenue, and, and I look on from Sarasota mm -hmm. fondly on Central Avenue. Sure. And there are many restaurants uh, and I saw from some of the pictures that we had, you've been so kind as to provide for us, mm -hmm. the cozy corner. Yep. Uh, and many of young folk, young folk, what's young folk? Sure. Uh, of your age and sure. under, uh, look at the, the whites, in this, in this case, the family, Moses White's sure. family, there's that has a long history there and some good some bad mm -hmm. but anyway when robert bud thomas here in sarasota a barber mm -hmm. who started a baseball team that was what we now call little league mm -hmm. and our team 
played, I didn't play baseball. I was a statistician. Okay. But uh, anyway, played a team, one of the Mr. White's team, Moses White. Mm -hmm. And one of the treats was whenever we went to Tampa to play that team, the Tampa team, we'd be taken to the restaurant and we had uh, a lunch there mm -hmm. before heading back to Sarasota. Uh, and Tampa had over a hundred businesses on Central Avenue in its heyday. Yeah. You want to talk about some of those? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's, it's interesting too, when you're working on a film, it's, it's hard to include everything. You know, so there are references to some of the restaurants, but uh, you know, I'd love to talk about all the businesses and uh, mm -hmm. every individual that's involved. But um, yeah, when you talk about the cozy corner with Moses White, you talk about the Palm Diner, mm -hmm. you talk about the uh, Rogers Dining Room with G.D. Rogers, who also owned Central Life Insurance at the time, um, the Cotton Club with Mr. Joyner, mm -hmm. um, Francisco Rodriguez had the law firm down there and was very prominent with the uh, working with the NAACP and uh, his uh, daughter Cheryl Rodriguez is a uh, professor at USF as well. She's in the film. Um, so there's a lot of reflections about Central, um, but what I, what I didn't want the film to do is I didn't want it to just be a reflection of everything good about Central because I wanted it to contextualize what was all that good embedded within Central and how did it demise with all of the sort of political and economic decisions that were going on in and around it. So Central is remembered in a very positive way in the film, um, but I do try to get into a lot of the formation of the biracial committee to the sit-ins, to integration of schools, to the eventual death of Martin Chambers in 67. So it's, it's always trying to kind of come back to Central Avenue in different ways, and how did uh, each of these things have a direct relationship with Central? One of the things that happened during that time and we always lament the children, the children, the children out of control. What do we do? But I hope somewhere you mention the youngsters in part of that negotiated agreement. The white hats. The, the white hats. Absolutely. That were hard hats that were painted white. And the youngsters, mm -hmm. the young teenagers, went around as a youth patrol. Yeah to bring back the calm. And the leadership, uh, Mr. Jarner and, and of course the Harveys and all of those people from that time, sure. that was part of the negotiation to pull back the police and give us a chance to get our community in under control. Absolutely. And without those young people, I believe three days may have turned into who Multiple knows what. Weeks. Yeah, exactly. Well, and James Hammond was the guy that was really the main um, leader of organizing and creating the White Hats. He was the director of the Commission on Community Relations at the time. He was an electrician also um, in Tampa, and so he's in the film as well. Um, and I, f I feel like his, uh, his story, I think, is one of those things that's kind of coming out in the film. Um, because we know so much about the business owners and the people who are mentioned in the park, but I think James Hammond is one of sort of those lost icons in, in Tampa's history, not by everybody, but I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, that's one of the things that I feel like is coming out in the film, though, is the role that he played in negotiating with law enforcement and organizing the White Hats, and it was over 100 uh, young teenage black guys that they got these hard hats for, and he was the foundation behind going to the store, getting them, and kind of organizing this, and and negotiating with the sheriff to say, you gotta pull people out and let us handle what's going on in and around. And so that story is absolutely embedded within the film itself about the White Hats. Um, and sometimes when things happen, and if everybody can calm down for a moment, step back, we can get control, we collectively, we. Mm -hmm. A community can get control. Uh, the uh, African American community got control. The city of Tampa got control. Mm -hmm. When everybody stopped and said, something has to happen. Yeah. Um, many people uh, of my age would re remember Coach James Williams mm -hmm. uh, from 
that era in Tampa. Yeah. He was a factor in bringing calm to the city. Yeah. Yeah, I've read about Big Jim Williams. Uh, mm -hmm. I know he passed uh, several years ago. He's another one of those, uh, one of the individuals that I would have loved to have talked to just because of the role that he played. He wasn't even living in Tampa at the time. He came back from coaching um, college mm -hmm. football. Yeah, um, coaching in Louisiana. Yeah, I think he was at Southern, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. So he came back from Southern um, to help sort of work with the youth patrol to, to really take charge. And he was one of those just, from what I understand, one of those prominent voices uh, in and around the community for those few days that he came back from Southern. And so it was a really just interesting dynamic, reading a lot of the old news stories, but then also reading, going deep into the sort of the papers and the special collections at USF from Bob Saunders and from Cody Fowler, who chaired the biracial committee, and Governor Leroy Collins at the time also. All of those papers are just sort of hidden gems of knowledge that I try to bring some of those documents to the present uh, and to the public, because I don't know that anyone really understands that they're there letters correspondence with James Hammond um, that I think helped give us that context that's needed about what was going on then because even though this is in media I worked in media the media happens in such a, a daily cycle that it's really hard to sort of step back and give that greater context and that's what I hope that the film does while using all of these various forms of documentation what you're looking at is a lot of the images just sort of in and around Perry Harvey Senior Park, and uh, it lays over the ground of what was Central Avenue at the time. Um, and what I find interesting and sort of challenging about Perry Harvey Senior Park is it is sort of a public acknowledgement of what was, what was Central Avenue and the civil rights movement and the role of churches in, in all of this time, but it's also sort of challenging because is it enough? Um, what is sort of the role of the park? Is it meant to be a remembrance or is it meant to try to bring economy into downtown to the Encore business district and, and living that's next to it? Um, what used to be Central Park Village is now Encore and high rises with first floor businesses. So is it meant to get people down there to circulate in there or is it really meant to help educate people? And uh, I think people can certainly learn if they go in the park and read and take the time to sort of taken the knowledge of what Central was. Um, but as Arthenia Joyner says in the film too, the uh, now former senator, she mentions that it's a good first step and it gives just a little nugget of knowledge. Um, but it's really upon each of us individually, I think, to make the next step and then the step after that to read more, learn more, talk to people, and educate ourselves about what Central Avenue was and, and sort of its rise and demise because it's it's not out there. And so I hope this film is sort of just that first step into maybe bringing some of that knowledge to the present and to the public. Well, you say you're a filmmaker and you're a professor and a PhD candidate, but you're also a historian. And that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I agree with uh, uh, Mrs. Joyner. It's first step, well, you've made the first step and we can go beyond that now and that's one of the things that we try to do with this program we try to bring knowledge to the community mm -hmm. expose it to things that are important uh, f from my perspective if no one else's sure. that um, they may not otherwise know and encourage them to go and become immerse themselves in it and become, because as you talk about it, I remember when you talked about G.D. Rogers, mm -hmm. Central Life Insurance. Well, G.D. Rogers started Central Life Insurance and black folk had problem getting life insurance. Yeah. G.D. Rogers also had a home in Manatee County. Yes, he did. In Bradenton. Uh, G.D. Rogers, uh, 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 wife was with Mrs. with Dr. Bethune, mm -hmm. Bethune Cookman College, sure. on Mrs. Roosevelt's kitchen cabinet to make things done. All these things are important. Sure. How many young folks go to college now and go to Bethune Cookman College? Yeah. I heard of Bethune Cookman College. And have no idea who Mary Bethune is. Absolutely. And the history. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more. 
Yeah, so, and I think that's really, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic you mentioned I'm a historian. I, I interviewed several historians in the film because I, I needed them to give me the larger context of what was going on um, within it. But I, I do feel like I've, I, I do feel like I've learned just an immense amount um, during this process about, you know, I moved to Tampa in 2006 and didn't grow up in the area and I'm only 40 years old. So it's, it's just sort of one of those things that I feel like it was just the perfect storm of sort of myself and Central Avenue just kind of finding each other in this strange way. Um, and maybe that's my role is to bring this story to life or maybe it's just to engage conversation and, and let people hear the stories of Clarence Fort and of Arthenia Joyner and James Hammond, and Chloe Coney and Frank Gray, who was the police officer that patrolled Central and just all these individuals that if we don't take the time to ask questions and engage in knowledge before people pass also, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're just, as everyone says, we're sort of doomed to repeat our past if we don't understand a lot of where this came from um, and what led up to the events of 67. And, you know, that's really what the Kerner Commission 68 was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I identified all these problems of why people were rioting in the summer of 67. And if you look back and read it and read that now almost 50 years later, it's mm -hmm. a lot of the same problems that we see now. So it's just, it's important to engage in conversation to figure out how can we collectively engage in conversation and dialogue to move things forward. You know, um, the attorney, uh, Rodriguez. Yeah, Francisco Rodriguez. He is important to this community also. Sure. He was, he didn't, intend to be a civil rights attorney, mm -hmm. but he had, he, he, time and place said a lot about what his role became mm -hmm. during the movement. And in Sarasota, th those from the local NAACP often went to Tampa to sit with Mr. Rodriguez yeah. and talk about what can we do? What can't we do? Mm -hmm. And uh, we represent us too. Yeah. And we don't have any money. Yeah. And the role of a Rodriguez, uh, you can't put a value to it. No. Because you would think an attorney is a profession. You go and have a nice lifetime and make lots of money. Mm -hmm. But when you're committed to the struggle, you stay and you help. Yeah. And that's his role. Yeah. And I think um, what's interesting is getting to know his daughter really well, um, Dr. Cheryl Rodriguez at, at USF. She's <coughs> just, she's a wealth of knowledge. Um, but I think, I think Francisco Rodriguez is kind of one of those names that's known within the black community, but not, wasn't prominently Beyond. known outside of. Um, and so he's mentioned in the film um, a couple times as well. Uh, I know he took on, I don't know how many pro bono cases um, and was sort of the lead attorney for the NAACP for the state. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, his impact spreads from, you know, south all the way up to the capital and, I mean, everywhere. And, you, you know, you mentioned here in Sarasota, Manatee County having a lot of influence. And, you know, his hub was just in Tampa, but his impact and his fingerprint, and same with Bob Saunders and... Mm -hmm. um, Reverend Lowry and a lot of those individuals had just such a wide-ranging effect on the state of Florida. They just happened to have their hub in the Tampa Bay area. Bob Saunders was the field director of the NAACP for Florida. Mm -hmm. And after Bob Saunders came Marvin Davies. And Marvin Davies was the special assistant to governor, mm -hmm. then Governor Bob Graham. It's uh, yeah, I mean, the, it, it, the influence of, of every one of these individuals and um, just had a f uh, film screening at the Bob Saunders Library and um, there was a specific decision that, that I wanted to make to have the first screening at the Saunders Library just because of, I think, his influence on the Tampa Bay area and just, just life in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's just very fitting to have it at the Saunders Library and um, just sort of as a reflection on the civil rights movement and, and Central Avenue and everything that it represented is just a perfect place to have, you know, was a great place to have a, a screening. Now, if someone who's watching this today would want to 
get sure have a screening absolutely I would love it yeah the the easiest way to sort of follow the progress of the film is um, we have a Facebook page it's uh, facebook.com slash Tampa technique all one word um, and any s public screenings that will be uh, taking place will be updated on there uh, I'm hoping to have it televised locally as well um, and then submitting it to various film festivals, um, including, I'm going to submit it to the Sar Sarasota Film Festival. So if the folks at Sarasota Film Festival are listening, hopefully you'll enjoy watching it. But uh, yeah, the Facebook page will be the easiest place to sort of follow along with the progress on, on where it goes and where people might be able to see it, um, as well as hopefully maybe down the road have some DVD copies that, that people could get access to. But yeah, the goal is just to get the story out there and, and, and engage in dialogue. That's really the ultimate goal of this project. Well, I'm so glad that <coughs> Alexis, who works here, mm -hmm. Alexis McKay, is a producer here, uh, brought you to our attention. Sure. I'm, I'm blessed that I've been able to, to kind of get the word out. And uh, she's just one of the many individuals that has helped sort of uh, get some media exposure and attention to, to have conversation. Um, Again, just to get the story out there, that's really the ultimate goal because uh, I don't want Central uh, and the, that story to be forgotten. And so that's sort of the ultimate mission of the film and, and conversation is to keep it going. So yeah, actually, big thanks to uh, Ms. McKay. Okay. Well, got about 30 seconds. Anything else that I didn't ask that you want to tell us about? No, I mean, I th like I said, just ultimately, I think it's important for us to remember a place like Central Avenue within the larger context of everything that's going on within American society, not just from the 60s, but to realize that the issues and problems that persisted then are still very much relevant today. So if we remember and keep central in our memory uh, about what can and can't happen, um, then I think it's a, at least a baby step in the conversation to move things forward. And the women of Greater Hearst Chapel AME Church is having a Father's Day brunch at the Holiday Inn Airport. Get in touch with Hearst Chapel to get your tickets. And as always, have a great day, Suncoast. I knew I could get myself out of this. I just needed some hope and some help. I took the first step to recovery when I made the call. Since 2014, Addiction Hope and Helpline has answered calls for recovery and treatment 24-7, 365 days a year. If you're depressed, drinking, using drugs, or taking pills, call now and talk to someone who cares. I had problems just getting to sleep, drinking, and using pills every night. I feel like I'm losing control. I'm afraid I'll lose my job or even my family. Most insurance covers substance abuse. You can get back on track. Call now for hope and help with proven general recovery programs. I never thought that I could be somebody who didn't drink and use drugs. I have something to hold on to for strength. I'm in recovery, getting the help I need. Call 800-622-1941. 800-622-1941. Check out My Suncoast Dining on MySuncoast.com.